Hey, Tobin, we really appreciate you spending some time with us today. For our listeners, uh, kind of remind them a little bit about who you are and how you got involved in science reporting and producing. Sure, sure. So I, um, I got involved in science reporting after I left college. It was not something that uh, I trained for in college. I uh, was a biology English double major. Uh, when I first got out of college, I thought maybe I wanted to work uh, in research and work toward a PhD. But as it turned out, uh, and I did work in a research lab for a couple of years, um, that really wasn't, I think, where my interests or my strengths uh, lay. And so I, um, I got into, uh, got my foot in the door at the science and technology uh, unit. Uh, the year was 1990. I think I was 22, maybe 23. Uh, there was a very nurturing executive producer there who was really, really open to taking young people under her wing. Uh, and uh, I was very, very fortunate to connect with her. Uh, so I spent the next uh, 19 years at CNN, uh, first as an intern, and then I sort of worked my way up through every role in the science and technology unit. I was never the reporter, and I was never the executive producer, but I held every other job, researcher, associate producer, producer, senior producer. Uh, we were all shown the door in mass in uh, 2008. Uh, the entire unit was shuttered. And so I, uh, I started my own production company, which is really kind of a sole proprietorship, if you want to call it that. And I was fortunate uh, to connect with the National Science Foundation. And I was the executive producer of the Science Nation uh, video series at NSF for 10 years. Uh, that uh, wound itself down in 2019. And uh, since then, I've been working on many projects, uh, primarily with the PBS NewsHour, my, uh, my longtime uh, uh, collaborator, you might want to call it that, uh, Miles O'Brien is the science correspondent there. And uh, so we work together uh, on science stories for the NewsHour. So that's sort of my potted uh, biography. Uh, it's been a really interesting road. I have uh, had a wonderful opportunity to work on many, many, many different stories sort of across the whole waterfront of science and technology, space, the environment, uh, worked on lots and lots of stories. And the great thing about my job is that it's always interesting and it's always new. And, you know, it's always sort of coming up to speed on things that I didn't know and finding out a way to, you know, sort of turn around and communicate that. Well, first of all, that's fantastic. And, you know, I think oftentimes I, I'm an English teacher by trade, right? So when it comes to working with our students, trying to get them to realize that science writing is incredibly different from literature, right? Or from English style writing. How, when you're making decisions for, you know, what the stories are, what you're producing, how would you characterize um, an approach from, from that, from a science perspective, say, versus just like entertainment? What are some of the qualities or the criteria that you have to look at? Well, uh, the first, I mean, I, I work in television, you know, the television realm. Uh, so we have to think very, very hard about what the visual aspects of our story will be. There are many, many important and interesting, compelling science stories out there that don't have a strong visual component that we can get to, that we can take our camera and point our camera at it and get, you know, uh, the types of visual elements that we need to make an effective visual presentation. So, you know, right out of the bat, that or right off the bat, right out of the shoot, whatever you know, expression you want to use, that is an enormous factor that we have to, uh, you know, we have to think about and we have to figure out before we do a story on it. Um, as far as the entertainment versus science, you know, that's an interesting question uh, because we are working for a general news audience. And in every role I have been in, I have been 
been uh, looking to present information to a general news audience, an audience that doesn't necessarily know anything about science or about that particular topic in science. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we have to pick things that would engage the general public. It can't be too niche. It can't be too obscure. It can't be so technical that we can't make it work for a general news audience. So that's a big factor. Um, you know, uh, the visuals and the ability to engage the general news audience, I would say, are our two main criteria. Now, when I was with uh, CNN and we were, you know, literally reporting on a day-to-day -day basis, we filed a story every day, almost. That might be a slight exaggeration, but not much of one. Right. Uh, we stayed very close to the journals, to science and nature were the two big ones in science. Uh, medical news was paying attention to you know, New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And, you know, to the extent that we could stay very much um, uh, in the know on what was coming out in those journals and we could, you know, prepare stories on, you know, those papers, we did, and uh, you know that was great because the show producers at CNN would, you know, look at the New York Times and the Washington Post and the, you know, uh, Wall Street Journal, and those stories would be in those publications. And you know, it was always they were always happy to have us on the news curve, so to speak. Right. Right. Well, also, also true that. Uh, you know, when there's any kind of science story in the news, and it might be anything from a space mission to, you know, you name it, if there's a science sidebar to a story, if, you know, back in the 90s, if we could have, you know, OJ Simpson trial, there was all sorts of, you know, uh, interest in DNA and uh, how that all, for, you know, forensic, uh, uh, you know, study of, of medical forensics and, and what they were talking about in the courtroom for all of those hours. That was, you know, we were, we were always looking to kind of be on top of that. So staying on top of the news curve is a really big, important part of it too. But I'm, right. I'm running on. You had a question. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to back up and, and, and uh, highlight that you've already hit uh, another, a really good nugget, which was the, what I would call the value of having a good mentor early on in your career that you spoke highly of. I also want to uh, let you know that I was at the National Science Foundation from 2009 to 2015. So I saw your work there. I was responsible. One of my little duties was collecting nuggets at the end of the year for all the grantees, right? And I understand the value of trying to show the importance of a, 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 you know, a minimum federal investment in something so important as fundamental research. And it's very disappointing to me when I see, you know, a senator look through 6,000 or thousands of awards and pick out some that they don't understand. And, you know, when I, when I speak to my kids, I, I always point out that it doesn't seem that our government will fund education at any level, you know, at the appropriate level. But if you call it national defense or something related to the military, then we, we spend money on that quite easily. So... I understand the importance that you had of framing issues, you know, in a way that uh, Joe Smith, the average guy, can maybe understand the value. Um, um, one thing yeah. I want to ask you about was, uh, how, have, would you say something like IoT or blockchain is uh, difficult to visualize versus something like, uh, to me, satellite debris, when you guys, you know, when we see animations of a, a satellite being hit by something, and the debris field around the earth, that's a very good visual, you know, animation. Mm -hmm. But things like blockchain and cybersecurity, are those, uh, could, you, could you share a few of your um, topics that you've had to cover that maybe are the least visual and maybe some that you found were uh, the easiest to visualize? Right. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, when I was at CNN, we had access to a graphics department, and there were a couple of animators who worked up there. And uh, we could uh, we could put in requests, and you know they were busy folks, so it's not like they were spending 100% of their time working on science animations. But you know, if we had a story that was visually challenging, we could uh, you know we could 
try to think about how we could tell that with graphics or with animations. Um, but you're right, something like blockchain uh, or cybersecurity, they are challenging. And, um, you know, there's only so far you can get with, you know, production shots, uh, you know, kind of generic video. It can, it can get you part of the way there, but it, it generally doesn't make the most compelling television. Uh, but, you know, there's always a way uh, when uh, when you want to tell a story, uh, you just got to sometimes get really creative and think about it. Um, but to the extent that, you know, really compelling visuals present themselves, you can go out, you know, with a researcher, go to their lab, go in the field. Uh, a lot of what they do many times is is visual and is compelling and is, um, you know, there is there are things that you can point your camera at. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a constant balancing act between, uh, you know, going for the sort of easy visuals uh, and tackling more difficult subjects that will be more uh, challenging to tell. But uh, sometimes you just gotta you gotta do the best you can. You gotta get creative. You've got to think outside the box, and you know, usually you can uh, you can find a way uh, if you if you. Uh, uh, really apply yourself. So it's to, in terms of the you know most visual stories that uh, that we've worked on versus the less visual stories, I mean I, I you you do a lot with uh, with space. Uh, space stories are often very um, I'm not going to say easy to do, but there are elements that you can avail yourself of that NASA has created animations or put together, you know, visual elements that you can use to tell the story. Um, anything having to do, you know, with, uh, uh, let's see, what's a good example? I would, I would say animals, but sometimes animals, you know, can be challenging too. A lot of times universities don't exactly throw the doors open to come in and, you know, see the research you're doing on animals. But, you know, to the extent that you're, you know, out in the, out and outside, you're capturing animals in the wild. Sometimes you have to worry about, well, what happens if we get out there and you know the, you know the animal burrowed down in its den and it won't come out and you're waiting for days on end. And you know that that can be challenging too. But you know anything like that where people are out handling things and doing things and building things with their hands and they're moving parts. You know all of that's. Um, all that's very, very doable and will result in a very watchable story. Well, Stories that are not particularly uh, uh, visual friendly, anything having to do with like particle physics, that's a hard one. Yeah. Uh, climate actually is a difficult one. You know, there, there are elements you can do. And I was fortunate when I was at NSF to go to both Greenland and Alaska and shoot some of the work that's being done uh, you know, in the polar regions uh, having to do with climate, but um, a lot of times that can be a very difficult story to engage visually. So it's a mixed bag. And uh, as I say, you do the best you can and sometimes you got to get really creative. Well, let me throw you an example, right? Because as I'm listening and I'm trying to like, try to imagine what a car, so today, right? NASA will use a, a story straight from the, the news. So they're supposed to be trying to send something up or they've sent it up. Today is the day it's supposed to try to hit an asteroid sure. to see, you're right, right? If, if it would, so how would you, so for our listeners who might be going, wow, this would be such a cool career field to get into. How might you take something like that, which is today's the day, what goes into preparing a story of something like that? Well, we did that. So there's going to be a story on the PBS News Hour. That's why what, what I was doing this morning. Awesome! I'm going to link it. You'll have to send, give me give me the I'll link it in the in the bottom here. I will. I will. Uh, so what we did on that story uh, is we went up to the Applied Physics Laboratory, which is in Laurel, Maryland. They are the uh, entity that is managing that particular project, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, DART. Uh, and uh, they've got great media people there. We reached out to them and we told them we wanted to do a story and we'd like to talk about, you know, when we could come and who uh, from the program they could uh, make available to us. Uh, we went up there two, a little bit less than two weeks ago. We spent the day at uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory. We interviewed um, three different people who are sort of key to that project. Um, they put together in conjunction with NASA, um, uh, 
a suite of sort of animations that show how this works, as well as you've know, got your launch shot, you've got, you know, the spacecraft in the clean room as they prep it and prepare it and get it ready to go. Um, we went over to NASA headquarters and talked to the planetary protection officer, which is quite the title. You'd expect, you know, somebody in a yeah. cape. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> But now his name is Lindley Johnson. He's a very nice guy. And we interviewed him about it. Um, we have actually done a lot, Miles and I, over the years on asteroid, the risk of asteroids or comets or near Earth objects, as they call them, uh, hitting Earth. So we had a, a trove of, uh, of video or media that we had shot previously that we could draw on. Uh, and we, you know, Miles wrote the story and I edited the story and uh, it's going to be it's just a shade over seven minutes long and it's going to be on the PBS News Hour tonight. So that's um, that's kind of an easy one because we just had to go to one location to shoot interviews and everything else was sort of either an animation or something that we shot previously or right. you know kind of fell in our laps. Um, so there's a lot of travel involved in your your job for someone who's writing. Oh yeah, for sure, because you've got to go where the story is. The other two stories that have been on my plate um, most recently, uh, are, it was a two-part series on aquaculture. And that involved a great deal of travel. We were, we were up in Maine for the most part. Um, we went out offshore to one of these big, uh, uh, you know, offshore sort of salmon farms uh, that, um, uh, are really popping up. They, they, they've been around for a long time in, over in like Scotland and Norway, but they're they're coming on strong in the uh, Canadian Maritimes and also in Maine. So big, you know, salmon farms just offshore. We did that. We went out uh, with uh, uh, oyster uh, farmers and mussel farmers. There were we went to various research uh, institutions at the University of Maine where they're doing research in indoor tanks. Uh, we ended up going out to uh, Albany, Indiana, to the Aqua Bounty facility there. They are uh, uh, farming salmon on land and those are genetically modified. So it's an interesting element to the story. That was a trip to Indiana. So, you know, a lot of times you're going to in three different locations for one story. Uh, that's for a seven minute story. Most television stories are you know, more like a minute and a half, two minutes. Right. Anything longer than two minutes is considered kind of long by uh, right. network news standards. So you're not generally going two and three different locations to shoot a two minute story, but for a seven minute story you do. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work to get it all set up, get the logistics in place, make the timing work out, you know. Right get your crew where it needs to go, get the access that you need. It, it's it's uh, a fair amount of logistics to pull it together. Has, uh, in the, let's say, 20 or 30 years you've been doing this, has the weight of your equipment, has it decreased the mass because of miniaturization of electronics? Or it how would you describe it? It's, it's a tiny fraction of what it used to be. And it's a lot, lot, lot cheaper. Uh, when I first started in this business, they were right in the transition between three quarter inch tape and sort of Sony beta, which isn't the beta that most people think about. It's a pretty, it was pretty big, big camera. Um, those cameras, I, I don't know to the penny how much it costs, but think in terms of, you know, uh, $50,000, something like that. Uh, these days, uh, you can get a very nice camera uh, that can do everything you need it to do. It's not the top of the end line that they're using to shoot, you know, high budget documentary films or anything like that, but just a very, very, very good camera. You can get that for, you know, with lenses, $10,000 or less. So it's a fraction of the size, it's a fraction of the cost. And, um, you know, uh, it's made it possible for people like me who have a kind of a, a career in, as a producer, you know, I shoot a lot of stuff now. And that's because the equipment is just a lot more accessible uh, to, right. to people than it used to be. How, how long did you spend at, in Antarctica? Did you go to the research NSF research station there? Or what was that like? Because that's about the most 
desolate place on earth. I did not go to Antarctica. I would have loved to, but it didn't. Uh, yes. Uh, we were in Greenland okay. and also Alaska. And oh, okay. in, uh, in Greenland, it was interesting. We were in, um, uh, we had an opportunity to go up to Alula Sacks, which is um, uh, right at the mouth of the uh, uh, Jakobshavn Ice Fjord. And these roll off my tongue now, but in the beginning they did not. But what's great, I mean, that's where the icebergs are really coming off uh, the coast, the, the west coast of Antarctica. They come down uh, from the glacier and they calve off and they sort of float out as icebergs uh, until they get to the sea and then they float away. And I was not prepared for just the scale of the ice and the scale of the icebergs in that area. It was absolutely breathtaking. And, you know, we were out with a, a really great team, uh, David and Denise Holland, uh, who were out in a, not a small boat, but, you know, a smallish boat, you know, weaving between them. Uh, he drops these uh, probes down in the, in the water and sinks them down to the bottom so he can measure the temperature, you know, way down sort of at the, at the very near, near the sea floor. And, you know, we, we were able to go out with them when they were dropping these probes down and it was absolutely I and mean, we were that was really science and action that we saw there and uh yeah then we did a couple other stories down in uh, uh a little bit further down the coast but still in the arctic circle um really interesting stuff about uh you know uh, there was there was one woman who was studying arctic lakes uh there was another there's more research about uh how the the vegetation on the tundra is turning over. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because you go up there and they can do this research in the summertime anyway. They can do it 24 hours a day because it never gets dark. And, you know, they they have it going around the clock because it's just, you know, it's it's like noontime all, the, all, all day long. Uh, Alaska was similarly fascinating. We were up on the Ruth Glacier with a researcher who was trying to, um, She's actually, they would ski across the glacier, sort of uh, dragging an instrument suite behind them on ropes to measure the depth. They had very little data at that time, that was 2014 maybe, uh, about how deep the glacier was. They only had like one or two data points. So they would zigzag on skis across the, the glacier, dragging this instrument pack behind them. We were up in, um, uh, we were up at the, uh, Tulik Research Station, which is maybe 90 miles down the hall road, as they call it, right along the pipeline. Uh, Tulik Research Station is out on the tundra, and we were, we did two or three stories out there. It was, a uh, we were all over the place, and, uh, you know, again, I, I did not understand, because you think, oh, you know, you're in Alaska, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump from, you know, Seattle, you know. No, it's a law. It's a big, big, big country and uh, beautiful. We were out just very remote, pristine areas. Um, it was uh, both of those trips, just a highlight of my life to see what, what's going on up there. You know, and I'm listening to your stories and I'm imagining some, what an amazing job you have. I mean, it sounds like not only do you get the benefits, the perks of the travel, but you get to put a face, like you get to humanize these stories. You bring them into the rooms of the average citizen who might not otherwise really make that connection. So I think, I think for our, our students or even parents listening, what kind of skill set would you recommend someone have who might be interested in, in following your footsteps and maybe pursuing this as a career? What skill set would a person have to have to really do well in, in this industry? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you have to have a mix. Um, television and production, you know, film uh, is um, sort of a aroma all unto its own and you know a lot of people think well you know I'll just get a camera and start start shooting and and there's a lot to that and you should do that but uh it takes years to get good at it and uh if somebody wants to go into sort of science and technology related you know video or documentary film you know you need a very firm grounding in the technical um process of doing that and uh, 
shooting video and you know editing video figuring out how to do that you know well and understand all of the ins and outs uh, and you don't necessarily have to have a science background to do that you can but you don't have to but that's a big piece of it you know if if um, somebody wants to do it they need to find some sort of situation for themselves where they can learn that and you can learn it in school but you know i think it's kind of a it's a craft it's something that you have to learn as you go and uh, just get some experience under your belt. Uh, for people who are very interested in science who want to work in this field, I think that's great. Uh, and it'll help you because you know you uh, need to be comfortable talking to scientists. Uh, I learned a long time ago that there is no such thing as a stupid question uh, and that it's it's fine to, to understand the science to an extent, although, you know, you could know everything there is to know about biology, but that's not necessarily going to help you with an engineering story or the space story or, you know, a tech story. Um, your expertise, your deep expertise can only take you so far because uh, you're going to be going off in a million different directions. And, you know, unless you truly find a way to specialize and not very many people, I think, have that luxury. You've got to be able to be versatile. Um, so, you know, the good thing about it, you know, as I said, I was a biology major. I, I understood a little bit about how science works. I understood a little bit of the lingo and a little bit of the process, but you have to get to a comfort level where you're just like, I don't know anything about this. And I'm going to ask you probably, or probably some stupid questions. And if, you know, you just, you know, bear with me. Uh, I'm a fast learner and I will, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll listen and uh, uh, apply myself to to learn what, uh, what it is that you're doing. Um, to a certain extent, being an expert in the field might be a little bit of a drawback because- That's what I was thinking. Because you, you know, can't bring that humanity to the story like from the perspective of somebody who doesn't have that background. Right, you know, it's too tempting to get down in the weeds. Uh, a lot of times when we're talking to scientists, a lot of it is cajoling them to bring the subject matter, you know, up from, you know, the weeds to, you know, a higher level where people who are not experts can kind of engage with what you're talking about, and understand what you're talking about. So, um, you know, it's uh, I, if if somebody wants to work in in television or film, you've got to figure out a way to learn how to do television and film. And then wherever your interest leads you, I think that's where your interest leads you. And if that's science, mm -hmm. then then great. And you know, other people are you know very into other things. Um, yeah. Well, I I have three questions, but I'll probably ans ask two of them. Uh, one, what makes uh, you and Miles O'Brien such a good team? Uh, what and and to what extent you mentioned you may edit some of his scripts? Uh, I'd like to know a little bit about the dynamic between the two of you, having met you a few times, at least two years at the Edison Awards, and yeah. and he's you know I I, I like him as well uh, based on the limited interactions I've had with you guys. What makes your connection uh, so viable? And that's my first question. I'll just stop there for right now. Well, we've got, you know, uh, the benefit of a 30 year, you know, working relationship and friendship. And, um, you know, he knows me and I know him. Uh, we know each other's strengths. Uh, we can oftentimes, uh, you know, just really cut to the heart of, of a, if we're having a discussion because we have such a long history together, we'll say, you know, it was like, and he says, yeah, it was like that. You know, we're not, if somebody trying to listen to our conversation wouldn't be able to follow it because we just, you know, we, we've got, we've got yeah. so much, so much history. Um, in terms of editing miles, there's two kinds of editing. There's uh, copy editing where I would look at his script and say, you know, I think maybe you should say it differently here, or you forgot to mention, you know, this point or that point, or I don't understand where you're, and, and, and we do that, but he's an excellent writer. And, um, you know, I, he's not, he is not a reporter that you have to, you know, kind of 
micromanage his wordsmithing. That's not, it's right. not necessary. His, his writing is, is excellent. And frankly, there are a lot of other people uh, at the, uh, whatever news organization you're working with, they're going to have a sort of a whole um, uh, group of people uh, who work on that for that network or on that show who are going to be going over scripts with a fine tooth comb. There are fact checkers that come in. So right. there's a lot of eyes that go onto a script. Uh, and, you know, I have my input, but it's, it's, it's not, I'm, 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 as I say, it's, it's, it's not anything that I have to, uh, you know, get in there and, you know, quote unquote, fix it. I don't have to do that because it right. doesn't fix fixing. It's good. So the other thing that I'm talking about is you actually take the media and uh, you use an editing software to match up the words in the pictures and right. to uh, uh, turn what's on the page into a video. That mm -hmm. is something that when we were at CNN, uh, there was a staff of editors that all they did was edit. And when we had a you know story that was ready to be produced, I would go talk to the scheduler and you know I would be assigned an editor. And as the producer, I would sit next to the editor, but he or she would actually push the buttons. Uh, okay. When I uh, left CNN and I started working for NSF, uh, and I was also doing some stuff for Miles for various projects, it became clear that if I could learn that skill. It would just be a really good thing on a number of levels. It would uh, uh, be cheaper uh, because instead of whoever was managing the money, usually Miles, instead of having to hire me and an editor, he could just hire me as a producer editor, and it would, you know, be a much more uh, efficient way of delegating out the work. Um, I would make a little bit more money than I would as a producer, but you know, I would do the work as the editor. It's a lot easier for me because I don't have to explain to somebody else what I want. I can just do right. it. Uh, so I actually have loved learning how to edit and editing uh, our stories and my stories. It's been a revelation to me how much I love it. And uh, uh, I wish I'd learned it a long time ago, uh, but there really wasn't a path for that at CNN. That's not the way they were structured at that time. So I didn't, uh, I didn't really learn it there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, there was another piece of the question about our, our working relationship that you asked. What didn't I cover that you wanted to know? No, I, I, I thought you did a great job. I mean, I, I could ask, uh, you know, a humorous question like, when was the time that Miles came to you and said, I want to do something? And you said, no, we're just, we're not going to do that. Is it, do you recall yes, one of those? <laughs> yes, you're there. Okay, no, see, no, all right. No, no, I'm, I'm joking back at you. Sometimes um, we do have to have those sort of reality check conversations, but right. you know, um, he knows what's possible and what's not possible. And we right. have to lie, so we don't really have, uh, we don't have too much of you know putting the kibosh on one another's ideas, um, uh, but you know uh, we do have a you know healthy back and forth about what we should do and what the most efficient way to do something would be, what the most you know uh, shortest point between A and B kind of a kind of a thing. We bat that around all the time, uh, right? You know, and two heads are better than one when it comes right, to right. Yeah. It sounds like a really good team. My my uh, our final question is this: If you could um, pick three stories in the next, let's say, between now and the end of the year, if there were three, you you could pick any three stories that you wanted to create. Uh, have you thought about those? Do you always have those sort of ready to go in your mind, or uh, what would be the three most interesting topics that you would like to produce uh, a segment for? in the next, let's say, four months? Wow, uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to give you a good question, a good answer to that question. As I say, I've been coming off a big sort of production uh, pipeline. And I'm actually gonna sit down, not this week, but probably next week and really get my, collect my thoughts on, on what, you know, my next story props are going to be. Uh, there is, uh, a strong appetite right now on uh, climate. So I really want to sit down and think about what we've done on climate and what we haven't done. 
uh, what might be some good climate stories that we could pitch. Uh, a story that I that we need to figure out what we're going to do. You know, uh, Miles uh, uh, made uh, uh, I think a big impression on a lot of people with his um, coverage of the uh, shuttle uh, Columbia accident. Uh, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of that in February, uh, so we need to think about what we're going to do about that. And I was. I was the space producer for him, uh, actually, for most of it. There was a, a another producer who was there kind of at the beginning, and then uh, he ended up um, uh, leaving CNN and, and it came to me, and I did all of the return to flight coverage with him. So we need to think about what we're going to do about that. Uh, that's a big one. Um, there's a story that, uh, that, we, that I very much like to do on the Florida wildlife corridor and we've been kicking that story around for the better part of a year and I think we might finally be in a place where you know maybe we can start to pull something like that together. There's a story that I've been wanting to do that I think would be really fun and we may have missed it for the season on invasivores, the notion of uh, you know nuisance species and invasive species are a problem you know, all over the country. And there is a movement to figure out how you might, you know, one, one solution might be figuring out how to eat them. Uh, and there are uh, chefs, in some cases, very high-end chefs who are putting together these elaborate tasting menus, all about invasive species. So we'd like to do that story. Uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, always, there's always good stories out there. It's just a question of sort of identifying them. And then it's kind of a puzzle to figure out you know, when is it ready? Might be that, you know, it's a great story, but the best time to shoot it is going to be next summer. So you've got to kind of put that on the back of the stove and yeah. keep stirring the pot. Uh, the story might fall in your lap that you know nothing about. You've got to get out the door and do it, you know, day after tomorrow. So there's that, you know, part of it too. Uh, it is, um, it's a constant mix and churn of ideas and scheduling and when's the best time and when is my schedule open? When is my schedule open to do it? Um, it's a, you know, it's a three three dimensional chess to figure it all out. But uh, as I say, I uh, uh, I'm putting some stories to bed, so that's going to be my job next week is to sit down and think deep thoughts about that. No, we we very much appreciate you giving up so much of your time today. It just sounds fascinating. And I really, um, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed hearing your stories. And uh, I know that our, our students, particularly the ones who are, you know, more in the the arts versus the science portion of what we do uh, are, are also going to be intrigued. So thank you so much for that. Yes. You're so welcome. I'm, I, uh, I really enjoy talking to you folks too. Yes, and, and uh, keep writing great stories or keep making great stories. And, and send me the link on, on the Dart if you can. I'd like to post, when this airs, I'd like to put this in the in the chat. I absolutely will. I, it will air tonight, and uh, NewsHour uh, is really good about getting their stuff turned around and posted, so I'll send it to you either tonight or first thing tomorrow. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you, Ms. Tobin. We really enjoyed it, and uh, I hope I run into you often. And, uh, and, and, and thank you for your time. Well, you're so welcome.